Just days ago, the world's most populous volcanic island faced an eruption yet again. As Semeru unleashed pyroclastic flows that scorched over 16 square kilometers, hurled house-sized rocks nearly 10 kilometers, and battered bridges 14 kilometers from the summit. Yet even now, the ground remains perilously unstable, producing sudden, life-threatening explosions. The official maps do not show the real danger zones, so how far did devastation really reach? And why are people still at risk? At the Glottic Parak Bridge, 14 and a half kilometers from Sumeru's summit, the eruption's reach shattered every expectation of safety. On the morning of November 19th, traffic crawled across the concrete span, drivers glancing up at a sky already darkened by ash. Sirens blared in the distance, but for the people here, Danger was supposed to be a distant threat. Something for the village's upslope, not this far down the valley. Suddenly, a wall of gray swept through the river gorge. The sound arrived first, a roar sharper and deeper than thunder, shaking the metal railings. In seconds, a searing wind blasted across the bridge, carrying hot ash and volcanic debris. Eyewitnesses described the noise as a freight train bearing down, unstoppable and blinding. Within moments, visibility dropped to nothing. Cars and motorcycles stalled as drivers scrambled to escape. Three people suffered burns, clothes singed, skin reddened by radiant heat, faces streaked with ash. Medical teams later recorded partial thickness burns, but no one was killed. Video from that morning shows panic and confusion. A motorbike toppled, its rider clutching their arm. Another survivor, interviewed from a relief camp, remembered, We saw rocks the size of our cars flying down with ash so thick it blocked out the sun. Then the sirens started. That gave us the chance to escape. The Gladic Perak Bridge itself remained standing, but the world around it was transformed. Ash blanketed the roadway. The river below, once a steady flow, churned with mud and steaming debris. Emergency crews arrived wearing masks and goggles, guiding dazed survivors to waiting ambulances. For the hundreds living in nearby villages, the bridge was more than just a crossing. It was a lifeline now threatened by a force that had traveled nearly nine miles from its source. What happened at Gladik Perak forced a reckoning with the true scale of Sumeru's power. Official hazard maps had drawn exclusion zones much closer to the summit, yet the pyroclastic surge had traveled far beyond those lines, enveloping a place many believed was out of reach. The injuries here, painful but not fatal, became a warning for everyone downstream. Distance alone was no guarantee of safety. In the aftermath, residents gathered on the bridge, staring at the scorched landscape, listening for more sirens. The ground still steamed in places, and every rumble from the mountain sent fresh waves of anxiety through the crowd. As the ash settled, one thing became clear. Sumeru's reach was greater, and its threat more unpredictable than anyone had dared to imagine. Satellite images captured within hours of the eruption revealed the true extent of Sumeru's devastation. A remote sensing specialist at the National Disaster Agency pored over multispectral data from Sentinel-2 and Landsat, tracing the fresh scars where vegetation had been stripped away. The burn area measured 16.74 square kilometers, an expanse that stretched beyond the official exclusion zone, running 17.4 kilometers southeast from the crater. This was not a single narrow path, the pyroclastic flows had poured down river valleys, then spilled over their banks, blanketing fields and villages that had never been touched before. Ultra-high-resolution commercial imagery, accurate to less than half a meter, mapped the abrupt changes in the landscape. Villages like Kajar Kuning and Kura Koboken appeared as grids of rooftops and roads in pre-eruption images. After the blast, those grids dissolved into fields of gray and brown, with only fragments of buildings remaining. Survey teams on the ground confirmed the satellite data. Up to 197 structures had been damaged or destroyed. Some were buried under more than two meters of fresh volcanic material. 
Others had been swept away entirely by the force of the flows. Field teams used drones to create digital elevation models, capturing the new contours of the valley. Where the river once ran in a predictable channel, the eruption had cut new paths and left behind thick, unstable deposits. These changes were not just academic, they would shape the next disaster. The altered topography meant that when the rains returned, water would find new routes, carrying mud and debris into places that had never flooded before. The landscape was now unstable. Grain size analysis and block mapping showed the violence of the event. Boulders the size of houses lay scattered up to 10 kilometers from the summit. Impact craters, visible in drone mosaics, marked where blocks had landed after being hurled from the crater. In some areas, the deposits were classed supported, dense with rocks and coarse material, while farther out, fine ash and pumice covered the ground in a thick, suffocating blanket. Community mapping became essential. Residents, local NGOs, and scientists shared geolocated photos and drone footage, assembling a real-time hazard map. GPS tagged measurements from the field, matched the satellite isopox, confirming that the official hazard boundaries had been breached. The remote sensing specialists' overlays showed the surges had escaped the main riverbed, crossing low divides and fanning out across agricultural land. Every new data point forced another revision of the hazard map, erasing the comfort of old boundaries. The forensic map produced in the days after the eruption told a story of unpredictable reach and overwhelming force. It revealed not only where the volcano had struck, but where danger now lingered, under ash, within unstable slopes, and along river channels that no longer followed their old courses. The ground itself had been rewritten, and with it, the rules for survival in Sumeru's shadow. Rain had been falling hard on Sumeru's summit for hours before the eruption. The mountain's upper slopes, already fractured and steaming, soaked up every drop. Water seeped deep into cracks and crevices in the hot lava dome, rocks so hot it could glow. With temperatures reaching well over 800 degrees Celsius, just below the surface. A geologist might compare the situation to a pressure cooker left on high heat, its lid riddled with tiny leaks. As more water entered, it vanished into steam, expanding in an instant. For every liter that slipped through the dome, steam expanded its volume by a factor of 1,700. The pressure inside the dome grew with every passing minute. Beneath the surface, the dome was a tangle of old lava, ash, and gas pockets, loose, unstable, and riddled with fractures from years of eruptions and rain. As the rainwater reached the hottest pockets, it flashed to steam so rapidly that the rock itself began to bulge and crack. Small rockfalls and puffs of white vapor signaled that something was changing. Seismic instruments at the Gunung Sawur Observatory picked up a pattern low-frequency tremors, short bursts of gas, and a steady buildup of internal pressure. For volcanologists, these were the classic warning signs of a dome on the verge of failure. The final moments happened fast. The internal pressure from steam overtook the strength of the fractured rock. The summit dome, already weakened by years of growth and collapse, could not hold back the force. In less than a minute, about 95% of the dome was destroyed, blown apart in a violent rush of ash, gas, and rock. The sudden release triggered a cascade of pyroclastic flows racing down the mountain's flanks and transforming the landscape below. A volcanologist described the event as a mountain-sized steam explosion. The mechanics are simple, but explosive and devastating. Rainwater, superheated by contact with volcanic rock, expands explosively, shattering anything in its way. The eruption's violence was not just a matter of lava and gas, but the invisible energy stored in trapped steam. The warning window, from the first seismic tremors to the dome's destruction, lasted about two and a half hours, long enough for sirens to sound, alerts to be sent, and hundreds to flee. It was a rare moment where science and emergency planning aligned. 
preventing loss of life even as villages and fields were erased. But the story does not end with the blast. With the summit dome gone, Samarimansis, Samaru's crater became an open conduit. Magma and gas now vented directly to the surface, producing a continuous lower level eruption. The ground on the upper slopes, stripped of its protective cap, stayed hot and unstable. Every new rainstorm threatened to send more water into the still cooling deposits, risking further explosions. For those living below, the mountain's power was no longer hidden inside. It was visible, audible, and in the days that followed, dangerously unpredictable. Fresh volcanic deposits from Samaru's eruption still hold enough heat to melt aluminum. Between 300 and 500 degrees Celsius, measured days after the main blast. On the surface, these ash fields might look harmless, already dusted gray by rain and wind, but beneath the crust, the ground is a hidden furnace. Rainwater soaking through cracks and loose pumice flashes to steam the instant it touches these hot layers. The result is a phenomenon as deadly as it is invisible. Secondary steam explosions, violent enough to hurl rocks and clouds of scalding ash without warning. Two such explosions erupted from recent deposits on November 22nd and 23rd, sending columns of steam and debris skyward in places that had been silent just hours before. Both incidents were captured on rescue team cameras, one along the Basuk Koboken River and the other near a buried field. In each case, the blast came with no warning, a sudden hiss, a burst of white vapor, then a shockwave that rattled windows in distant villages. Search crews scrambled to retreat, and official advisories went out within minutes. The only thing that prevented tragedy was luck. No one stood directly above the blast sites. The danger extends far beyond the initial eruption. PVMBG, Indonesia's geological agency, issued an urgent warning. Stay far away, even now, days later, the ground can explode beneath your feet, with zero warning. This is not an abstract risk. The deposits themselves are unpredictable, with hot pockets and buried vents scattered across kilometers of ash and rubble. Even experienced responders avoid these fields unless absolutely necessary, and only with thermal imaging gear and remote sensors. Rainfall is the trigger for these hidden killers. As storms return, water flows into the valleys, pooling in low spots and seeping deep into the fresh volcanic debris. The physics is simple but deadly. Water meets hot rock, expands instantly, and the pressure has nowhere to go but up. Unlike the main eruption, these secondary blasts can happen anywhere within the new deposits at any time, with no visible precursor. The randomness is what makes them so lethal. Lahars add another layer of risk. When rain loosens the ash and debris, it creates rivers of wet concrete, dense enough to carry boulders and tear through anything in their path. These flows move fast, often overtopping riverbanks and reshaping the landscape yet again. Satellite and drone images taken after the eruption show new channels carved through fields and villages, places that had never seen flooding before. Each new rainstorm brings another round of uncertainty as the landscape continues to shift and the ground itself remains unstable. For anyone tempted to approach the fresh deposits, whether out of curiosity, for rescue, or to salvage belongings, the warning could not be clearer. The ground is still moving, still dangerous and still capable of deadly surprises. The only safe approach is to stay away, heed the exclusion zones, and trust the science. As PVMBG's advisory puts it, the risk is not over, not by a long shot. The eruption's slow escalation gave authorities a rare gift, time. At the Gunung Sawur Observatory, PVMBG volcanologists tracked a steady drumbeat of seismic tremors and, and surging gas emissions, reading the mountain signals as they intensified through the late morning. By 1.30 p.m., the alert level was raised to its highest, 
AWAS, triggering a cascade of warnings to local officials. Within 45 minutes, sirens blared in villages downslope, and messages flashed across government phones and WhatsApp groups. Disaster management teams from BNPB moved quickly, setting up roadblocks and guiding residents toward pre-designated shelters. In Kurakobukan and Kajar Kuning, community leaders and volunteers hustled door to door, urging families to evacuate before the clouds descended. The alert system, refined after the deadly 2021 eruption, pushed out text message warnings to thousands. Some villagers hesitated, watching the mountain for their own signs, but most heeded the call. Traffic surged along narrow roads, families piling onto motorcycles and trucks, clutching bags of clothes and livestock. Even as ash began to fall, the evacuation held together. Over 900 people, including 170 hikers stranded higher up, escaped the danger zone in time. Emergency teams used radio relays and loudspeakers to reach remote pockets where cell service faltered. There were moments of confusion, conflicting messages on social media, last-minute scrambles, but the coordinated response worked. When the main pyroclastic flows thundered down slope, the villages were empty. The destruction was total, but the loss of life was zero. For the disaster response coordinators, it was a hard-won proof that science, communication, and community resolve can save lives, even in the shadow of a volcano. Heavy rain has become a familiar threat for those living beneath Samaru. Each year, as the wet season arrives, anxiety returns with it. December 2021, December 2022, and now November 2025. That makes three major eruptions all triggered by the first intense storms of the season. Volcanologists track this pattern with growing concern. The link is clear. When rain falls hard and fast on an unstable lava dome, the risk of catastrophic collapse and explosive eruption rises sharply. But prediction is only half the battle. Even with advanced warning systems and a network of seismic stations, gaps remain. Some remote communities still rely on word of mouth or spotty radio signals to know when to evacuate. Meanwhile, the exclusion zones meant to keep people safe are not always respected. Along the Besuk Kobokan River, sand mining continues despite repeated warnings. Heavy machinery and workers enter areas declared off limits, drawn by the economic need for construction sand. The tension between livelihoods and safety is unresolved and every rainy season brings a new round of conflict between local residents, miners, and park authorities. Samaru's continuous activity adds to the uncertainty. With the summit dome gone, magma and gas find an open path to the surface, producing ongoing eruptions and keeping the ground unstable. Fresh deposits from the last blast have not cooled, and every new rainstorm threatens to trigger more lahars, or hidden explosions. For those living and working on these slopes, vigilance is not a choice, but a necessity. The mountain's history is repeating itself with unsettling regularity, and the danger now is not just from what happened, but from what could happen next. Samaru's landscape remains unstable with fresh pyroclastic deposits capable of erupting again when it rains. For the communities below, vigilance isn't optional, it is survival. Three major eruptions in five years mark a new pattern, not a freak event. In Java's shadow, disaster isn't history, it's a cycle waiting for the next trigger. Stay alert and let your voice join the conversation below.